What's up, world? I'm Matt Newberg from Hungary, and this is The Feed. Each episode, we'll dive into conversations with the industry insiders who are leveraging technology to shape the way we eat. On today's 100th episode of The Feed, I sat down with Cole Jones, founder and CEO of Local Line, an e-commerce network connecting local farmers with restaurants and grocers. In this episode, we'll talk about the importance of keeping food dollars within local economies, how large QSRs like Chipotle are using the platform to purchase tens of millions of pounds of local produce, and how farmers can tap into a marketplace of buyers looking for new suppliers. All right, Cole. Well, it's awesome to have you here. Um, to all listeners out there, this is our hundredth episode, so this is a very big deal. And we have wow, Cole. I'm honored. So, Cole, um, no pressure or anything, but you're my hundredth guest. So, thank you for making the time. Uh, I'd love for you to talk about the founding story of Local Line, which I believe dates back to your college years. So, talk about how you started in the dorm room and the problem you're looking to solve for farmers at that time. Sure. Yeah. Um, no, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. And now it's, uh, yeah, we really got to do it right here. A hundred episode. That's a big deal. Um, so yeah, local line started as sort of the proverbial dorm room startup. And it started because where I went to school was largely, uh, farm fields, you know, a hundred miles in every direction, more or less. And, uh, I got to know some of the, uh, local farms at the farmer's market. There's a big main farmer's market on the north end of the city in Waterloo, Ontario, where I went to school um, and spoke to a lot of the farmers there. And we figured out that uh, far- farmers markets were more of a necessary evil for them, like the, than they were a really good sales channel. Um, it wasn't really profitable most of the time. It was just kind of was like the best avenue they had in a lot of cases to offload some product. So that was the initial startings of, of local line was in my third year of my undergrad, we were trying to ask ourselves this question of, yeah, what would a better model for the farmer look like? And how could you build something that would work for them? Very interesting. I want to understand. Yeah, I uh, kind of, you know, some of the um, scrappy tactics you took early on. But first, like, tell us what you think is, let's dive in a little bit more into that problem with farmers markets, and what's broken there, uh, because I find that really interesting. Uh, Yeah, Let's let's start with like, what is the major headache for farmers there? I don't have anything like I'll, I always need to preface this by saying I don't have anything against farmers markets. I think they're fine. I think the people that run them are well intending folks that work really hard. But it's a pretty bad business model when you think about it. It's like a grocery store that's open like one or two days a week for a few hours. Right. Um, and it's outside, so hopefully it doesn't rain. And if you live <laughs> in Canada where I live, they're very seasonal, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a pretty high cost. Uh, there's a high opportunity cost for the farmer, right? If you have a market on a Saturday, you're up at four, you know, you're packing the, the truck, you're sort of like finalizing harvests, you drive to the farm, to the market, you know, you sell uh, half your stuff, you sell three quarters of your stuff, you sell, you know, a third of your stuff. It's it's unpredictable. You maybe try to give it away at the end of the day or you end up bringing it back to the farm. You pack up, you drive home, you've missed an entire day on farm. You know, mm-hmm. your weekends basically get taken up. It's, it's, just a, it's just a high cost, right? It's not to say it doesn't work for some, but you're not gonna, you know, maximize the potential of our local food system with just farmers markets. I don't think there's anybody that would disagree with that statement. Right. And that was how, well, that was what we had heard from a lot of these actual farmers that were at these markets. Um, And that's why that, that, that's what set us down the path. We were like, well, you know, maybe initially we thought maybe restaurants was the Avenue. And then we can get into the the scrappy part of your question of like, Mm -hmm. what the heck did you do to like actually start this thing? Um, But the, the, the initial idea was actually to pair farms with restaurants. Interesting. Yeah. Take us through that journey. Um, I guess at a high level, I, I saw a blog post where, uh, it was described as you driving around in like an Acura MDX with all yeah. the, uh, all the orders. And, uh, I don't know what the tech you were doing using at the time was, but certainly have come a long way, but let's, um, it's, I, I find it very interesting to, to, um, 
you know, see how entrepreneurs solve for things early on. I, you know, like I love the founding DoorDash story um, of what they were doing and um, yeah, take us through a little yeah. bit of that. So yeah, meet a bunch of farmers and they basically tell us, Hey, farmers markets are, you know, kind of this necessary evil more than it is a really profitable way for us to run our farm. And so we organized a bunch of meetings. We would drive out to the farm, sit down at their kitchen table, and these farmers would largely just open their books and be like, all right, like, here's what goes into farming. It was this sort of like accelerated education of what it's like for the farmer from the time that they put, you know, a seed in the ground or, or, or you know, have a, a chip or something right up until the point that they actually have a finished product and they're ready to sell it. Mm -hmm. um, and so the initial hypothesis for us was like, well, um, there was a lot of pretty high quality chefs in our city in Waterloo um, and chefs fancy themselves artists in a way, you know, they don't go to culinary school to cook with pre-breaded frozen chicken breasts in a box, right? They, they, they want to work with good stuff, good, good quality mm -hmm. product. And so our thinking was the benefit to the farmer for the chef is that the orders are much larger, you know, cause you're ordering on behalf of an entire menu. They're a bit more predictable because you, you kind of know generally, right? Within a range, how much ground beef you're going to use week over week at your restaurant, if you're doing burgers or something. Um, and it was a little bit easier logistically because you could just consolidate a drop. You didn't have to, you know, deliver to like a hundred different people's houses. Mm. So this was this initial hypothesis, but yeah, we had, we had no money, no tech and no experience. So like we had a Shopify storefront on the front end. I had a bunch of spreadsheets on the back end, and then I had my trusty Acura MDX and, and that was old reliable. <laughs> um, I don't remember how many miles it had on it, but it was a lot. <laughs> um, and that was it, right? So like the, the, the chef would submit their order. So we would go around to all these chefs who'd be like, Hey, we have all access to all these products. It was a lot of Mennonite farmers because those were the only ones that would work with us back then. And they didn't really use technology. So it was like a perfect <laughs> partnership because we could, you know, partner with them. Um, so yeah, we had like, we, we listed ground beef, we did some onion, we did peppers, we did potatoes, um, got like staples. The chef would submit their order. I would coordinate all the logistics and invoicing and payments on the back end with the spreadsheets and then would actually drive to the farm, pick the product up and then drive it to <laughs> chef. And then, yeah, just tried to like coordinate that and classes. And I mean, I was not the best student to be, to be honest, uh, but that's how it started. And then by the time I graduated, the business was actually working at a micro level in our city. Like I was making enough money from it that I could just pay my rent. Uh, so I didn't have this burning need, like a lot of my friends at the time to like need to go get a job or something. So I just kept working on local line. And it was in that first year working on it full time, where it became clear that, well, I, th I think I always kind of knew that like, schlepping potatoes around in, you know, some old SUV is probably not the best business model in the world. <laughs> but that's when it became clear to us that if you want to have a big impact, in this space, it's got to be software based. So you have to just build the default kind of commerce system for all of these local food transactions. And then it also became clear that the way to go and get a bunch of buyers was to go and get a bunch of suppliers first. So we mm -hmm. ended up focusing the first few years of our business, just building software to help the family farm mm -hmm. run their business better. Got it. And then you pivoted away from restaurants towards uh retailers right yeah we've kind of come full circle back to it in the last year which we always knew we would like we always knew there was this moment where we would then you know call it engage the buy side of this market again where we would work with restaurants and grocery stores and hospitals and schools and just just a variety of food buyers and we do do that today but in order for us to add value to some of these big buyers that have big, big like sourcing needs. Like, you know, you really have to have a certain scale. Mm -hmm. We needed to make sure we could go and build up a base of farmers that was adequate enough to support that. So we just built software for that farm in many cases, moving them off of sticky notes and spreadsheets. And we just sold that product a few thousand times. So right. we have a whole bunch of these farmers on it, which, you know, makes it easier for us to add value to the buyer. Got it. And that's like a single player mode, so to speak. <clears throat> it wasn't Yeah, it is. It's a single player mode. We would sell a farmer on our software platform. 
and they use our software for their customers. It can be CSAs that are like going direct to a household, or again, like they could they could be individually selling to you know oh. restaurants or grocery stores, and they they Great. use it as their operating system. Great. Okay, we're going to definitely dive into that, but first, I, w- I would love to just kind of paint the picture of you know the current agricultural landscape in America. Uh, between the large guys, uh, the factory farms, so to speak, and the small to medium sized farmers. So, yeah, what is what does that breakdown look like? Uh, yeah, let's start there. Well, the overwhelming majority uh, of farms in America are small family farms. Um, there's about two million of them that operate on. I believe the stat is 25 hectares or less. So call it call it roughly 100 acres. Um, or less, and and they produce about thirty six percent of the calories um, mm. that we eat, or the, the the agricultural value. And then, yeah, there's a top end of the market where you have the top ten percent of these industrial scale, you know, cash crop farms, and you know they 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 produce basically the rest of it, right? <laughs> right. Uh, so it's like ninety ten split. Ninety percent of the small family farms produce a little more than a third of the of the calories, and. Um, wow. Yeah, so it's a big percentage. People sometimes think that local food means like, you know, hippies at farmers markets kind of thing. Um, but that's not <laughs> actually true. Um, there's there's a tremendous number of yeah family farms that are growing, you know, produce and meat and, and dairy and, you know, different products uh, every day that, that, that we actually like end up on our plates. Um, but again, like prior, prior to local line, a lot of them were, it was just a very fragmented market. It was a lot of uh, text messages and phone calls and you know, spreadsheets. And then uh, we wanted to give everybody like a common system to use so that they could, you know, better get, get access to market in a better way. Got it. So let's go dive into the pitch. Uh, let's start with the, the farmer pitch, uh, the long tail, so to speak. I mean, obviously there's new, you know, nominally a huge amount of these guys, but like you said, they only, they count for the minority of calories. So what's your pitch to those farmers and I guess, how are you helping level the playing field for them? Um, I mean, so yeah, farmers are, are simple folks and they like simple pitches. Um, and that's what we like. And at the end of the day, local line for the farmer is about one of two things, either making the money or saving the money. And the reality is that it's some combination of the two of those things. Mm -hmm. Farmers tend to be really good at farming. They tend to, you know, not be expert sales and marketing folks. Um, but this is a big opportunity for, for farmers is to actually go direct to customer. And for the first time, or at least in many cases for the first time, become a price maker, not a price taker. Mm-hmm. This is a huge difference, right? If you're just growing a commodity or you're selling on the commodity markets, you're a price taker. Whatever the price for that bushel happens to be that day, that's what you get. You can do small amounts of marketing to optimize that, but like that's pretty much what it is. Um, in the local line business model for a farm that is, you know, running on local line, they get to decide what they grow, how they grow it, where they sell it, at what price point, when they ship it. They're in the driver's seat. Um, so a lot of the value comes back to that, helping that farmer secure their future as an independent entrepreneur, where they have the opportunity to run a profitable farm the way they choose to run a profitable farm. Love that. I like the the price taker versus price maker. Very empowering. And we look at now, okay, so now you have all these farmers signed up. Now, how do you go and take that and pitch that to the demand side, the buy side? Like the, the pitch for the buy side is basically, look, um, local food is... 10% of your volumes today, but it's 90% of your headaches. Uh, it's pretty hard. And we're going to solve those 90% of headaches for you. And as a result, we're going to unlock uh, the ability for you to scale a local program. So all of the things that are holding you back from buying more locally today, and it's not, it's not just about local, it's about the transparency, it's about how it was grown. It's about the quality of the product, the taste of the product. And in a lot of cases, the price of the product. Shortening these supply chains is really, really important. Like it's, an, it's, an, it's a newer thing, but it's a very, very important thing for some of these retailers. Um, and so, yeah, basically the idea here is, look, this is a category that you have never wanted to get into. You've been pulled into it by consumer demand. 
And you sort of do it because you have to. Comes with a lot of headaches, a lot of juggling of different vendors, different orders, payment methods, fulfillment. And, you know, we're going to show up and we're going to, number one, make that process easy. And number two, we're going to open up this access to all of these new folks that you can build a relationship with. Great. Um, great stuff. So let's, let's dive into the product. Uh, let's un walk us through kind of what that looks like as far as, you know, uh, a restaurant or retailer places an order from one of your farmers and then a bunch of magic happens and it ends up on their loading docks the next day or whenever it's supposed to come. Uh, talk about like what that looks like from your product and, and how that reflects itself in, in the modules that you had to build for this product. Uh, that's a good description. It's just like place an order and, you know, wave the magic wand and then it shows up the next day. Uh, that's certainly how we want the buyer to feel, right? Is that it's that easy. Um, the, the three main modules in our system that are consistent across the buyer and the supplier is, you know, buy food, sell food, right? Pay for it and get it fulfilled. Like that, that's really the three main components. There's a lot that goes into each one of those things. Um, there's a lot that we had to build out on the inventory management side for the farmer, as an example. You know, a farmer might sell products in different packages, different prices, different minimum orders, arguably different taxes, depending on the state or the area, the zip code, right, of some of their different customers. So when that customer gets to the online store, the buyer, and they see a list of products, there was already a lot of work that went into figuring out what is the right configuration of products to show them. And then when they place their order, there's already been a lot of backend work that's been built into the system. So they know when it's going to get delivered. Does it match that farmer's existing distribution schedule or does it come through a food hub that's in our network or a third party shipper? You know, what, what's the minimum order and the lead time and any fees that are associated with that? So basically all of the groundwork is done for all of the actual like order fulfillment is done in the software. It's done on the farmer side. And then all that information gets conveyed very simply in just a, what you would think of as a common e-commerce interface to the buyer. So farmers have to upload their inventory and keep that current on your system. That, that is the system of record for the farmer once they kind of sign up. That's correct. Got it. And then like, I guess, uh, let's talk also about business model. I realized we, we gla glazed over that. Uh, you're selling to farmers. Like if I go on your site and look at your pricing, this is what it would cost for a farmer to sign up. Uh, how does it work with the, you know, the QSRs and the retailers as well? And, yeah. Yeah. We also, we also, there's three different pricing plans for those on the, on the buyer side. So if you're like a, a QSR, um, we have two prices that we offer that are on a per location basis. There's call it like a basic pack and then call it like a premium pack. And it somewhat depends on the features that you need. Um, one of the main things that it depends on is also whether or not you're going to use what we call our forager service. And our forager service is where we actually go out and find products that you may not have that you're looking for on your behalf. So mm -hmm. we take your search criteria and we go and build relationships, you know, with you, like, or for you on your behalf with these farmers. Um, and then there's a third category, which is just the classic custom, which is like, hey, if you're, if you're a large enterprise, we do a lot of work with Chipotle as an example. Um, so if you're someone at Chipotle's level and you need something that maybe is a little bit more custom to their supply chain and their, their procurement needs, um, then we work with them from there as well. But basically the, the simple way to think about it is that it's a, a monthly subscription on the farmer side, and then it's a monthly subscription on the buyer side as well. Right. So SaaS plus payment, uh, spreads. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's also payments. Yeah. Monetization in the platform. It's not everywhere. It depends on a few things like how the, the payment was made, but, but yes, that exists as well. Do you have any sense of the, t uh, the total addressable market that you would basically say that you'd be, you'd be going after as far as like 
the longer tail of farms uh, and capturing all those payments? Um, it's a hard, so the payments, like the total, the total sales of local food is a, it's a hard question. The USDA says that it's about $40 billion a year in local food sales. Um, there are lots of good reasons why that may not be the most accurate number in the world. My gut says that's low um, based on what we've seen. But like <laughs> the local food data is a kind of a black box still. Source data collection from the farm is really hard at scale, right? <laughs> um, and so, yeah, as a result, there's really no mega data set that one can point to and be like, Oh, hey, that's the number. Um, other than just you know what what we see in the market, and maybe you know referencing that against some other statistics that get published. Right. There's there's so many different channels and different ways of defining it. Like um, those laws that allow you to like cook from your home and sell food. Yeah, yeah, um, like the cottage cottage, uh, cottage laws. food laws or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then farmers market. No, there's also just a lot market. of it that. There's just a lot of it that doesn't get reported, right? Like, just like as an example, like um, we work we work with a retailer that buys from you know one of the largest uh, produce farms uh, in America that then they use our platform to transact. And this large produce business, they they operate a lot of different farms and fields, and they also procure from lots of different farms, you know, from all over. And there are certain times of the year when things are in season that the product that's coming, you know, to the retailer comes from just, you know, down the road, right? Or 50 miles away. Like it's from a farm there that they, that they have and they operate. And that's local. That's by definition, right? By most people's definition, local. But that would never get, like we see it, but if we didn't see it, we wouldn't know what's happening, right? That would just never get reported on any other survey or statistic. So it's just, it's just been historically difficult for anybody to kind of get like a, a really good grasp of actually the total opportunity other than to just, you know, say, Hey, you know, it's, it's, it's really big, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a big, big market. Everybody's got to eat. Um, fascinating. So, so how many retailers and farmers are on the platform? Then like, kind of talk about this, how you're starting to see this marketplace come about where you have restaurants and retailers on the demand side, local purveyors on the supply side, and you're kind of connecting them. Yeah, our our farmer network is a little more than 13,000 now, and that covers um, every province and state of North America, as well as uh, the, seven other countries. Um, and so mostly English speaking, like the UK and Australia and New Zealand and stuff, but we do we do have a sort of a small and increasing international footprint that's there. Um, and then on the retailer side, it's like a few thousand retailers. I mean, um, Chipotle has, I think, a little more than 3,000 restaurants, um, and they use the product. And then there's also retailers and other other groups in there as well. Right. So there's a, a thousand banners. A thousand like not not lo not versus store, like versus locations. We're just distinguishing between yeah uh, yeah sure yeah sure customers sure, versus yeah. locations. Like locations could be a multiple of that. Yeah. And so, what does that look like? You know, you. You spent a lot of time over the last six or seven years um, building up that supply. Now you're getting up, getting the demand. You know, what does that look like when they're browsing? Um, and then when do they need to call in the foraging system to see yeah. something that they, that they can't so, get? Um I love that name. So by the first way. Local, urban foraging is my favorite. No. So, <laughs> and I'll tell you the backstory here quickly on this. It's because we acquired a business <clears throat> called Forager in uh, uh, late June. I think it was when the deal closed. Could have, could have been July. And Forager was a marketplace to help grocery stores buy local. It was a great fit for what we were expanding to this year. And um, we did that deal and that's what they called it. They called it foraging. So when a grocery <laughs> store would call them and be like, hey, I need whatever, local mushrooms or something in an area that, that this business wasn't that dense, 
they would go out and they would find it. So we just adopted the name. So I can't take credit for it. We didn't come up with it. Actually, it kind of already existed in this other business. Um, but um, sorry, yeah, you were asking about just what it looks like. So there's a few things here. So the first thing to note is that um, there is like a, there is a farm search function that sits inside of the buyer side platform. So you can get in there and you can basically like search for different farms. It's opt in on the local line side for the farmer. So just because you use local line, if you just have a CSA or something, right, and you just sell to consumers, like there's really no reason for you to be listed in like a wholesale kind of a, you know, farm search. Mm. So you don't have to be, right? You can, you can choose to not do that. Um, so the farmer's in control of their visibility. For the farmers that are showing up on the map, normally the way that you approach it with the buyer is not to just throw a thousand farms at them and be like, here, good luck, like sorting through all of this. Normally, there's a lot more that just goes into the pro that, that a lot more that, than the product when you're picking the right supplier. It's not just like, hey, I need someone with tomatoes, right? <laughs> they should be a certain, you know, quantity and size should have a certain like certification. Maybe that farm needs a gap certification or something in a certain location with a certain season, right? Certain like packaging price point and, and frankly, just a relationship that you want to have. I want to talk to the other person on the other line before I send you an order for 25,000, you know, bucks worth of Roma tomatoes or something like that. <laughs> so normally what happens on the buyer side is it starts with them just defining their criteria hey, these are the kinds of folks that are good partners for me that I'm looking for. And then from there, they can narrow their search. They can look at it on a state basis, location basis, and they can figure out who it, you know, is a good fit. The foraging service comes into play where just like as, as an example, um, we don't have, local line doesn't have as many farms in South Dakota. So let's say that there's you know, a retailer that's in South Dakota or there's a location there and they really need a product and it's not there you know, we'll go find it. That's basically the idea is that we have a deep enough network of farmers now um, that we can go and we can find the right supplier with, you know, that meets those criteria. And these suppliers would, would not be on the local line platform yet, correct? Exactly, exactly, right. If they were, then they'd show up. But then if there's nobody Got in that it. area, no problem, like we'll go and we'll, we'll find it for you. Okay. And then I'm also curious, we didn't touch on this yet, but like the, the logistics part of actually getting this these items to the customer the customer being the retailer the restaurant who's the i mean now you're an asset light company so to speak no more acura mdx what <laughs> tools do you do these farmers need and these retailers need to uh, transact and, and get that last mile or get that kind of uh the the transportation network figured out yeah. So most of the time for the farmers that are selling to restaurants or to um, retailers, they're at a certain size where they actually are like running their own trucks. You know, it's not a fleet, but they normally actually are running their own distribution at some level. Um, and it's normally done on a city by city basis where they might say, hey, I deliver into San Jose uh, on Mondays and Thursdays. And my minimum order is 200 bucks. My order lead time is 24 hours, um, you know, whatever the sort of criteria are. And so normally what happens is the customer, when they're the buyer, when they're checking out, they just get filtered through that process at checkout. There are lots of different ways that the farmer can set it up though. If the farmer wants to be a bit more flexible, they can connect with other food hubs on local line. Food hubs are like local food distributors. So they can basically find other partners on local line to help distribute their product. Uh, or we also have integrations with other third-party carriers. So they could integrate with, you know, a third-party shipper if they needed to and offer something that's like daily or, or a little bit more flexible if it's something that the farmer can't meet the needs of. But normally, honestly, and this isn't a hard number, this is just like my, my guess based on what I'm seeing is that probably about 70% of the time, uh, it's the, the farmer running their existing distribution schedule. And then there's probably 30% of the time where there's maybe something more creative that gets set up in order to help the farmer get the product mm -hmm. to the customer. Are any of these solutions ever like white label logistics, like Uber direct or DoorDash drive, or is that only suitable really for like getting me a cheeseburger or pizza? pizza? It's, it's mostly 
suitable for the cheeseburgers, not because it's a cheeseburger, but just because they're more built for urban environments. Mm -hmm. Right. Like the, the, the likelihood that your DoorDash guy is going to like drive 50 <sighs> miles out of right. town to like pick up, you know what I mean? <laughs> a like a, a skid of bell peppers or something. Yeah. Right. And bring them back in is like pretty low. So um, that'd be great if any of those services want to get more rural, then that'd be awesome. Right. Uh, but no, it's normally more traditional uh, third party folks. You think of like, you know, FedEx or mm -hmm. in Canada, we've like Canpar or you know, UPS or like other people that can help, you know, have refrigerated okay. stuff like space and move food around. Got it. Um, and then for food hubs, just to pull on that a little bit, these are, you think of them like, these are not public facing stores. These are all like warehouses that essentially house inventory for lots of different types of farmers so that uh, distributors or some some truck some sort of last mile transportation network can plug into that and get product from point A to point B. Is it, what's the they right way to think to of this? They tend to have a yeah. They t so a food, the way to think about a food hub is basically just like a small food distributor that just specializes in local. So they still tend to have like a name and a brand and a website and stuff. Like just like think of like a micro version of Cisco or or, or U.S. Foods. It's just just for local. They tend to buy from, you know, call it 50 different farmers throughout the course of the year. They have a warehouse, so the products get dropped at the warehouse. And then from there, they fulfill the orders, you know, to whoever that customer happens to be. Sometimes it's pretty simple, just drop, repack. Sometimes they're actually literally repacking the product. Sometimes there's value add stuff. You know, there's situations mm -hmm. where they're turning carrots into carrot cake, right? Mm -hmm. And then that's going out the door to to a customer but the general way to think about it is uh you know just think of like a, a small local food wholesaler right and they get who's taking on the inventory risk are they more like a 3pl or are they actually like a distributor and taking on the inventory it depends there's lots of different models the most common is that they do take on the inventory risk where they're actually purchasing the product from the farmer and then applying some some markup again very classic like you know wholesaler distributor style um but there's other models that we've seen. We've seen consignment models. We've seen just like straight straight markup models where the farmer maintains ownership yeah. until the product is delivered. Um, right. You know, it gets done different ways. So, like, what you know, the, the classic statistic is like you know farmers in America who are farming under kind of you know they, they, they're they're selling commodity crops at a price that they're not setting. They're getting fifteen cents of every dollar. Uh, what what is the case here on local line? On average, yes. <laughs> well, the yeah, the margin capture for our farms on on average tends to be about eighty four percent. Is normally where wow. where it sort of hovers. Sometimes it could be eighty five, could be eighty three, but like tends to be about eighty four percent. And that's when you average it across. So like you have farms that are selling direct to the customer. That's that's the most you know gravy, so to speak. Like you get a hundred percent of that dollar, but <clears throat> you incur additional costs on the back end. Right now you're the one delivering it to the customer. Right. There's maybe other packaging, you know, things that are involved there. Mm -hmm. um, and then yeah, when our farmers sell through through food hubs, like I mentioned, normally that food hub might take a 15% or 20% or 25% markup or whatever is involved for them to run the logistics, you know, of mm -hmm. their, of their business. Um, but that's, that's pretty much how it breaks down for us. So the farmer gets to yeah keep the, the overwhelming majority of the dollar. That's great. It's like five times better. Um, okay. So, so let's talk about like the farmer and how, how, you know, you've been able to onboard them. So many of them, I guess, like, you know, what have been the, the, some of the hurdles or what are the common misconceptions around onboarding them? And I guess like what, how receptive like, have they been through these conversations of like making this big shift towards the digital era? Th yeah, thankfully it's a lot more common now than it was. It's gotten a lot easier um, where if farms don't have a system today, they all generally agree that, they need one and it's good to have one. And if they, they do have a system, then the question is, do you have the right system? Um, which is, which is normally a decision that they make basically annually, um, on whether they want to move systems or not. Um, you know, in the beginning, in the early days, it was just good old fashioned cold calling, 
um, back when that was back when cold calling was acceptable. You know, today you get a cold call and you're like, oh my gosh, like who is calling my cell phone? But like, yeah, no, back back <laughs> back then in like you know 20, 2017, maybe 2016, 2018, it was like not as much of a faux pas, I guess. So yeah, it was a lot of just like pounding the pavement, um, talking to farmers in in our community in Ontario and just trying to build enough of a relation, like enough of a reputation that you could get a little bit of, you just need a little bit of brand lift, right? Um, and that's what's helped us a lot over the, like the, in the last years. So um, 80% of the farms that, that, that we onboarded came from organic channels for us, like not, not paid advertising, um, which is mostly just word of mouth. You know, farming is a really tight knit community and that's a double-edged sword, but we made it a point to really invest in customer service like a lot from from day one and just be position ourselves as a partner to the to the farmer as opposed to just like you know some other software program um so it it just takes time it's like just brick by brick right you just got to like earn your reputation um and provide good service and then you know word gets out and then how does like is there an exponential factor of like customer growth when you sign on one farm that they bring along all their accounts as in like retailers to this platform and make them sign up? Uh, how does that kind of onboarding work as far as the kind of referral component of that? That work, that's not, that's less so than you think when a farmer brings their own customer, that's their own customer. And so that buyer doesn't log on and see other farms that sell other similar products or even adjacent mm -hmm. categories or anything like that, that's still like a one-to-one -one relationship. And then our job now is to just go and talk to on the buyer side or like independently ourselves, the brands that care deeply about local and we can be the most helpful for. So that's not related to the buyer that a farmer might bring if they mm -hmm. sign up to local line. Our team has this interesting challenge and opportunity ahead of us in the years to come, which is how, how do you take advantage of some of those synergies? Um, but that's a real balancing act and, you know, not something that we are, are doing today. So let's just say I have an orange farm. I have a couple of different restaurants and markets. I move over to local line those restaurants and markets now order from me on online instead of placing a PO, however they did it before through the fax machine, through a pigeon, through the, whatever it was, picking up the phone, but they don't have to pay for it. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. God. So it's a, it's a, it's kind of has a viral loop, but you're just saying you haven't really monetized, like gone, taken action to really upsell those. It uh, definitely accounts. does. Like there's a lot of virality that's baked in there, but the thing about the food system is it's just a very, very relationship driven business. People tend to buy from who they know. Um, there tends to be longstanding histories here. Uh, you know, the, this whole, like the open marketplace idea, um, not only does it not work, it really dramatically dilutes the value. I think of a lot of the existing relationships that are already there. Uh. Um, and it's really just not how people, when you're building a supply chain for your food business, it's just not how you think and work. It's like, hey, let me search for 22 different lettuce suppliers and like pick the one with the lowest price or something like that. Um, and so, yeah, that is not how it works in our platform today. I think we can find ways in the future for us to do more what you might like it's i don't know if it's the right word for it but what you might just think of as matchmaking you know like i think we can just find more scalable ways and better ways to do that with the buyers and the suppliers that are on our platform um but that's a that's a future coal problem right? right i mean we'll we'll figure that out when we get there yeah it's an interesting conundrum i can see that being a very um delicate thing to to balance and something that where you you have to get to a certain scale where you can uh, kind of wield that power and, and essentially, um, you know, uh, I guess appease the the buyers at the potential expense of the suppliers by saying, hey, 
you might want to check out this other guy who's a competitor to this one that you're already buying from that's selling it X percent cheaper. Certainly have seen this in the restaurant space. Uh, did did a podcast not too long ago with a company called ZD that really wants to bring radical transparency to restaurants. Uh, I could definitely see that, see that playing out here at some point in the future. Yeah, you know, we're pretty we're pretty clear as a team that the most important customer for us is the farmer. In fact, it's kind of the only one that matters um, because the network of farmers is what allows us to do this work to improve the food system in the first place. So they're kind of the, they're the boss, right? Um, whatever is like, it's a pretty far line in the sand, like whatever is best for the farmer is generally, you know, uh, the way that we go about things. And, um, I think that's, it's just kind of part of the culture, right? So, but anyway, just, that's just back to the point of like, yeah, we have some interesting stuff to figure out there in the future. Um, that's great to hear. Um, there's definitely a lot of companies out there. I won't name names, but they definitely say one thing and they don't do that. Thing. You know, like <laughs> we love restaurants, but we know that ain't true. Yeah. Um, but I believe it from you. So earlier this year, uh, you got a, a very interesting investment from Chipotle's cultivated next cultivate next fund. I'm really curious how they discovered you and how that kind of came about. And then uh, I guess like talk to us about how they're leveraging you to kind of satisfy their goal that they stated publicly, which is that they're going to purchase over 37 and a half million pounds of local produce in 2023. Yeah. Um, sort of back to what I was mentioning just about food being a tight knit, you know, community. That's how I initially got connected to the folks at Chipotle. It was from a friend of mine that was in a different area of the food system that, you know, then found himself uh, working alongside the Cultivate team, wanting to figure out how to leverage a brand like Chipotle to, you know, innovate and make the food system better. Um, and so spoke with him initially, uh, got to know the produce team specifically at, at Chipotle, which is, you know, largely the group that runs their local program, which is the 37 and a half million pounds of local produce that you stated there. Um, got along with them really well. And it was a little lucky where they had, they had already done a bunch of homework, not on local line, but they looked at uh, all the other systems uh, and thought about what they needed. Um, and it ended up being a great fit, you know, the more that we got to know them. And so, yeah, signed the, the partnership deal to like work with Chipotle on the, the local program. And, and, and then after that, then you get the call on the investment and they're like, you know, hey, well, you know, while we're doing this, right, maybe we should think about, you know, ways to maybe make it a little bit more permanent. Um, you know, excellent experience with them over the last year. Honestly, I cannot say a good, enough good things about the people there and, and the team. And I know everybody says that. I'm not really not just saying that. They are a very, very, very special, high quality, you know, group of people. And I'm specifically talking about the people I'm closest with in the in the produce office um, are just top notch. Um, but the, yeah, so we've worked with them over the last year to onboard all that 37 and a half million pounds to our platform. So all of the like existing local program that they were running, all of the suppliers, like they're all of their, what they call growers, their farmers, their distribution centers, their restaurants, like that program it now is transacted through local line. So, so that's been implemented. And then we're helping them do what I mentioned before, which is the second part. Hey, let's open up access into some other places you've maybe wanted more local, but I don't have it before. And so we've had the chance to work with them on a few different occasions over the last year, you know, in different markets where they're looking for different local products and we've been able to help them find it. Fascinating. So that when we look at transitioning their existing produce vendors or their farmers, over to local line does that same relationship that i described where we were talking about with farmers bringing their retailers on board apply here where those farmers don't pay local line they have they and they may not even show up in the marketplace because they're just dealing with chipotle there's like a grain a line in the sand there yeah you totally got it right so like when chipotle brings one of their farms to the platform that farm has a singular relationship with Chipotle because that's who they transact with, which means that by default, unless they opt in, which they can do, um, and some of them have, 
you're not opting into the farm search. We certainly hope that those growers, some of which ha did and, and are, had a great experience using local line with Chipotle, and they decide to then onboard other retailers that they're working with um, and other buyers that they're working with. So it's a little bit, it's not at all at once. It's a little bit of a transition from when they first get connected with one group like Chipotle to ultimately, you know, deciding that they do want to leverage the platform for other relationships as well. Yeah, I see that as a win-win because if they can get, get enough scale, you can drive down the costs and um, definitely much, much more advantageous on that side uh, for the farmers. Um, so I'd love to talk about the competition because you mentioned that Chipotle, you know, vetted a bunch of other competitors. Um, <clears throat> originally, I was thinking about, you know, the Shopify types of competitors like Gray's Cart, Barn to Door, but like who else? is in there and like where do you see yourself really you know like wh wh what did chipotle see in your product that was really your competitive edge that made them decide to not only work with you but also uh you know make that investment yeah um there was i think i mean the, yeah you can ask them as well but i think i think if they were on the call they would say a few things um Number one, our farm search was quite enhanced. My understanding is quite quite enhanced compared to our competitors. Our data was pretty good, like our structures of data, helping them understand who had what food safety certifications and where they're located and all of the other things that aren't just, hey, do you have a tomato like we talked about, right? So, so we were pretty feature rich there. Um, there was definitely a really good culture fit there. Just going back to the customer service side that I mentioned, um, you know, that's a big one for Chipotle. It was a big one for us. And so there was just a lot of good opportunities for us to work together. If they said, Hey, we need this. And we were able to go and find it quickly. There was just like a good, a good sort of like similar shared values, I think on how we actually wanted to work together there. Um, and then just size of network is important. Right. We have a fair number of farms. We spent a lot of very focused time in the early years of our business getting those farms. And that certainly makes the network more attractive. Right. Arguably, the arguably the software doesn't really matter. There's lots of people that can build software, but the network of farmers is, is super mm. important. So I think it was probably a, a combination of those three things. And I'm also sure they were positive. They probably just like took a bet, you know, at some level anyway. And we're just like, Hey, yeah, hopefully this goes, goes well. And, uh, you know, it did, it went, it went great. The Facebook of local farms. Yeah. That's, yeah <clears throat> Facebook of local. I've never heard that, but that's not, you know, it's not incorrect. Yeah. I'm not going to use that for the title. Don't worry. Um, no. Okay. <laughs> so I guess I, I would love to like, you know, as we kind of come towards the end, I'd love to talk a little bit more about some of the more environmental and sustainability focus and health related benefits of, of supporting local economies. So like I, I talk about the triple bottom line there and kind of what needs to happen for us to make it so that we can uplift these farmers to be account for more and more of our calories and have it kind of work uh, on all three of those angles of just our wallets, our health, and our planet. Um, yeah, local food is like kind of the last localized economy in a lot of senses, right? Like the shirt you're wearing was probably not made close to where you live. <laughs> Same thing with the headphones that you have or the desk, right? Or like, you know, most things in your house. But in terms of like, yeah, economic lift that you can get from local food, it's kind of the last thing that is, you know, grown, distributed and consumed in your local community. So there's an extreme recycling of dollars that happen in that environment versus the dollars going to a corporation that, you know, is somewhere else. Um, and you largely just don't, don't see the benefit of that. So there's, there's, yeah, a lot of economic incentives, um, which are kind of like high level. If you get a little bit more narrow and focused on it, like there's a lot less food miles that 
you know, local food travels, the, the, the national average is that uh, food that travels from farm to fork uh, travels about 1500 miles to get there. It changes hands about four to six times, right? On local line, it's like 120, 130 miles. Like it's like it's really close. Um, and that that do, generally it can mean you know less emissions, like less like shorter supply chain. But it also just means a lot fresher product and more nutritious product, right? The minute that you pick an apple from the tree, it starts to die. It's a living it's a living thing, right? And so there's a lot of benefit to local for these retailers because the, the taste is there. It's high quality product. The nutrition profile is better. And this isn't, I, I want to be careful. This isn't blanket statements. This is just generally the case. Um, and also, it also lasts longer, right? Like the shelf life, if, if, the, if the shelf life of your product, if it was in the field yesterday and now it's on your shelf, it's going to last for longer than if it sat in a truck for five days, right? In order to like get to you. And then you ended up putting it on the shelf there too. So um, that's a little bit of word, a word vomit. I wish that was a more structured answer, but like yeah. uh, in terms of, yeah, some of the environmental benefits, there's, there's a lot of them. Um, love it. And then w w what do you think outside of technology, what sort of policy or consumer shifts or, you know, what needs to happen to, oh, to jumpstart that so, fire? Yeah, we got to make it so much easier to uh, process meat at a state level. Um, and in Canada at a provincial level, hmm. right, right now, these, these big four meat packers control 80% of the meat packing market, which means that 80% of the meat that you would pick up at the grocery store comes from one of four different companies that operate only a few different plants, right? Like it's not hundreds of plants. Like it, these, these are massive operations, but it makes it very hard for small and medium sized livestock farms and ranches to actually find processing facility like capacity for themselves at a local level in order to get their product processed to be able to sell it to these customers. So yeah, this is like a big bottleneck. There's, there's a particular demand in the market right now for high quality meat. Um, and uh, yeah, unfortunately the biggest bottleneck is actually, there's just, there's just not enough abattoirs like state licensed abattoirs um, or provincially licensed abattoirs to, yeah, to fulfill this demand. So it's, uh, I kind of, I kind of beat you. To, I kind of jumped on that question, but it's a topic I'm, I'm passionate about. And I think it's, uh, I think it's a real problem. And what about the idea that local food is more expensive? How, how do we fix for that? I mean, nobody's going to deny economies of scale, right? Like, yes, sure. Um, if you're producing more like niche, high quality micro batch things, they can be more expensive. But a lot of this is also marketing, right? A lot of this is also like the consumer is willing to pay more and the retailers know that. And so they're able to negotiate, you know, a big markup on that product or they list the product at a big markup because they know the consumers are going to pay it. It's kind of a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy where like they mark it up because it's good marketing and, you know, it's decent margin and they have to do all this extra work to get it. So they need that margin in order to make it worth it. And then the consumer pays more and they think it just always costs more. And because they're willing to pay more than they market up mm. more. So you get into this little bit of this kind of like cycle where like I, I've, I've seen the opposite, right? I've seen, I've seen some retailers and, and some restaurant groups, you know, actively, you know, go direct to farm in every possible case that they can remove distributors, you know, from that chain. Um, and as a result, being able to pick up a lot of margin, you know, be able to provide the farmer some certainty, guarantee, you know, certain volumes over the course of a season. Um, and, you know, if that's, if that's the case, I've seen many cases where local is cheaper because there's mm -hmm. a lot less hands that need a piece of that pie as it moves through the supply chain. Wow. So it's just a matter of passing that those savings on to the customer versus hoarding the profit essentially. I mean, it's a general answer. It, it kind of, the, the honest answer is it kind of depends on product. It kind of depends on place and time of year. It's it's a bit of a moving goalpost, um, but you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know these these big big broadline distributors they they have a lot of overhead. There's a lot of warehouses and trucks and sales reps and people and marketing and customer service and food safety and logistics and insurance and like take pick your thing on a P and L. Like there's a lot of cost that's there, right? And so. You know, depending on what you need and where you want to get it from, uh, you know, you should be able to find a local farm. And if if that's 
you know, if you have an opportunity to do direct relationship with them, direct business with them on a platform like ours, you know, you can make up a lot of margin that way. Oh, Cole, this has been an awesome conversation. Kind of as we come towards the end, I'd love for you to just talk about, you know, if we think about the next decade, what are you really optimistic about or most optimistic about when it comes to building more of these local localized supply chains? And then what do you think is going to be the, the positive second order effects of that shift? I mean, I'm, I'm most excited just about the, I think that food, there's this new kind of call it movement if you want with, for food as medicine. And there's even insurance companies in the United States now that are actually helping write programs that, you know, give you certain diets to help treat certain illnesses and diseases. Food is probably, it's, it's the biggest like driving force for good that I know of in society, period. At a micro level, at the personal level, the food you put in your body has a tremendous impact on how you feel and who you are and how you operate. And at a society, all the way up to a societal level, as macro as you want to give it, right? Um, you know, there's really, really important decisions that we're making every day on the food that we put in our bodies, I'm very hopeful over the next 10 years that more and more people start to, not everybody has that philosophy, right? Or feels that way. I hope more people do. And if we have the opportunity to help more farmers become price makers, not price takers, like I said, I really think we can unlock the potential for these regional food systems. We can start by saying, hey, what's local around me and maximize that market. And then you can import all the other stuff that you need, right, as a supplement. But right now it's the opposite. So I, that's what I'm like most excited about working on, um, which is just a continuation of the work that, you know, we're already doing. Um, but I'd love to just see, yeah, healthier, healthier society as a, as a result of that. If we can put better food in people's bodies and we can maybe cut back on some healthcare costs, you know, treat health a little more proactive, a little less reactive. If we can, you know, help bring some life to some of these rural rural areas and, you know, make farming, um, you know, great again, for lack of a better term, uh, you know, uh, I think that's, that could be a really good thing. Okay. Amazing stuff. Um, if people want to learn more about local line, tell, tell us, uh, how farmers can get in touch, how retailers can get in touch, restaurants can get in touch. Maybe you even have some job openings. Uh, now's your time to plug away. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, every, so localline.ca, everything's on our website, two words, local, and then line, L I N E.ca. Um, all of our contact info is there. You can email us sales at localline.ca uh, with any of your questions or, or your inquiries. Um, I will also look at those emails and respond to anybody, you know, that has any questions about our business. Um, we are planning to open a few roles, uh, both on the sales and on the development. Uh, so engineering side of our business in January. So if you're an excellent salesman or woman um, or developer, uh, then uh, yeah, we would love to to speak with you too. So I think I plugged everything there. Well done. Uh, this has been a, a great uh, conversation. Um, 100th episode again. Thank you for making it happen and I'll be following along closely. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. If you like what you hear, please hit subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast. And if you're curious to get a first-hand look at the cutting edge of food and tech, check out Hungry.tv. That's Hungry with No You, where you can join in on live conversations like these or sign up for the free weekly newsletter.